So here's what I need, church. I need you to get your seatbelt on because I'm going to ruin some stuff for you today. And you're going to be really upset with me. <laughs> um, but it is what it is. We want to make sure that we pledge allegiance to the kingdom first. And so there's a lot of allegiances here that I believe that the enemy is going to break off today as God's children come out. And so let's start, Sebastian, with the first one. So there's a record that happened this year. 60,000 Jews came in from around the world. Uh, Isaiah 11 says, In that day, in that day, speaking of a future day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time. The first time God already did that when he brought captives back. But there's a second time that's speaking to the future. And so this is a biblical prophecy that's coming true. He's going to gather the nations and he will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And this is happening. This is September 20, 2020, a report from Israel. Now, listen, church, I know there's some of you that get all into genealogies and are those the real Jews? Are those the fake Jews? Are those the Ashkenazi Jews? Are those the, and you go deep into that stuff. Listen, scripture warns in Titus chapter three, be careful of genealogies. It also says, after you warn the person once, have nothing to do with them. Listen, I don't know if those are all fake, God knows his people. There's always a remnant. There were 7,000 that didn't bow their knee to Baal, and God knew all 7,000. Here's the promise. In the last times, he's going to gather them for the four corners. It's happening in our time. Israel was not a nation until 1948. These are signs for us. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 24, please. Second picture, please. I don't have time to go deep. We are doing 30,000. Say 30,000. 30, so you're going to have to put your seatbelts on right now. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, when his disciples are saying, hey, when is the end coming? When is the end coming? Jesus gives some description of what's going to happen at the end. And one of the markers of the end is called the abomination that causes desolation. Let's look at Matthew 24, verse 15, please. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken up by the prophet Daniel, last week we went back there. Basically, it is a person that is going to be in the temple being worshipped, claiming to be God. Guess what? In Israel, there's no temple right now. But you can go online and research the Temple Institute. The Temple Institute, they've already raised the money. Homeboys from the Temple Institute. Sebastian, next picture. So you can see this. Old Testament commands that you have to have a red heifer without blemish, in which there's no defect, on which a yoke has never come, in order to begin the worship in the temple. They believe they found the red heifers from a ranch in Texas. Go back, Sebastian. There's five of them that came. Big celebration in Israel. You can go look it up. They're ready to build the temple. And they're so ready to build the temple, they're, they're ready to make a covenant with anyone to get that temple built. Jesus said this has to happen. Go down to verse 20, chapter 24, verse 21. I'm showing you these things because there's a lot of things happening, and if we're not aware, we're not going to be ready. The church, we, the bride has made herself ready. Matthew 24, 21. For then there's going to be great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world. You need to highlight that. When has that happened? It hasn't happened. 
When will it happen? We've been talking about that in Revelation. A great tribulation that has never been has come. And we've been studying that, Revelation 6 through 18. Jesus is talking about that, a great tribulation. No, and never will be, Matthew 24, 22. And if those days had not been cut short, no human would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So God is saying he's gonna shorten days in order to save his people out of this great tribulation. Let's go down to verse 32. Matthew 24, verse 32, from the fig tree, and I want you to highlight fig tree, and I just want you to put a Hosea chapter 9 above the fig tree and learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, this is really, really important, church. Please look at me as I explain this to you. The vine is a symbol of Israel in the Bible, but it's their spiritual privileges. The fig tree is a symbol of Israel as a nation. The olive tree is a symbol of Israel's spiritual privileges. And we know that because we Gentiles are grafted in as a wild branch into what? The olive tree. So those three trees describe Israel, national, religious, and spiritual. Understand what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, hey, look at the national fig tree, Israel. It doesn't mean that they're spiritual, by the way, because they're not. 98% of Israelites right now in Israel don't follow Jesus. The veil, Romans 11, the veil is over their eyes right now. I want you to understand something. When Jesus came to Jerusalem, what did he curse? He cursed the fig tree. He cursed it. And for 2,000 years, the nation has been spread all across the globe. But now, recently, it's come back. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's what Jesus is saying. Verse 33. Verse 33. And so also, when you see all these things. So Jesus is saying to see, to look, to be aware, to be watchful. You know that he is near. He's at the very gates. Jesus is at the very gates. Truly, I truly, I say to you, this generation, highlight that this generation, a biblical generation is anywhere from 40 years to 100 years. How do we know that? Because the children of Israel were in Egypt for four generations, 400 years. So 40 to 100 years, biblical generation. Jesus said, This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So Jesus is like, hey, bro, you you need to listen to me. This whole planet's gone before my words are gone. That's the the original language. (laughs) Next picture, please. The question is, in 1948, this is what Israel looked like. Desert wasteland. Next picture. It is green. It is blooming. It is exporting produce all around the world. It is flourishing. There are leaves on the tree again. It is beginning to produce things. And Jesus said, watch for the fig tree. See what happens. Not the spiritual fig tree. Not the spiritual fig tree. But the national fig tree. You look for that and see what happens. And no, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place. Quote, unquote, Jesus. Jesus. So listen, I believe your children will see the return of our king. We are in the end times, people, according to Scripture, Bible prophecy. This is why we're starting out with this. Next picture. Now, here's where everything gets ruined for you. George Washington. He is a Freemason, and he's in his Freemason garb, and he's laying the cornerstone in 1793 for the Capitol building. There's master masons all alongside of him. 
You can do research, but here's the ceremony. Next picture, please. Inside the Capitol Dome, where Washington went to heaven. Let me go point to it real quick. When you look up close, these are pentagrams, and there's 72 of them, which when you get into Freemason religion, 72 demons have come down. We don't have time to get on it because we're, we're fast-forwarding. I want you to understand, Jesus, Moses, disciples, they're not there, but you know what's there on top of our Capitol Dome building? Gods that are sacred to Freemasonry. Hermes, Neptune, Venus, which is Isis, Minerva, Vulcan, which is Satan, and also the son of Jupiter and Junia. All up there. Not the Christian God. Next picture. Please. Thank you. I want you to see something. Last week, we, we talked about the religious mystery Babylon, and I said it might be, it could be the Vatican. And now here we are in 18, which is the Babylonian world system, and I want you to see the similarities. You see the Vatican dome. What is it facing? An obelisk. It's created the same way. Washington Capitol, what is it facing? An obelisk, the same way. Now, I know there's kids in here, but this has sexual imagery where Freemasons believe that an entity is going to come down and give birth to a new human race. I can't get into this because we're going fast. All right, next picture. I want you to see, this is in the Muslim world as well. What is there? The dome and the... So there's similarities here. We need to understand that. Next picture, please. I want you to see what's around, the the circles around the Washington Monument. It's a true picture. And as well, in Catholicism, the obelisk is in the circle I think we understand what that's meaning. Birds and the bees, okay. Next picture. This is the Washington Monument. I want you to understand that the Washington Monument is is a phallic symbol. And again, if you don't know what that means, just go research it. It's also known as the shaft of Baal. It's also built by Freemasons, and it, it was built by Freemasons and dedicated, dedicated to our nation. Why did they build it like that? Inside of a circle. It's, it's 666 by 666 by 666 by 666. That's the measurements. The height and the top. Okay? That may ruin it the next time you go visit the Washington Monument, but I'm sorry, you can do your own research. Next picture, please. On the History Channel, this is the layout of Washington, D.C., I want you to understand this right here is a Masonic symbol ending at the Capitol, and then you have the pentagram as well. Remember, 72 pentagrams on top of the roof of the Capitol with all of the pagan gods on top of that. Next picture, please. Why is that important? Because the Masonic temple is a supreme council, 33rd degree temple. You can go visit it. But everything has been created in certain points to draw demonic powers down. The White House is at the end of the point. The Washington Monument is right there in the middle. The Capitol building is right there. The Jefferson Memorial. All these things are laid out in a way that wasn't just an accident. You can't make this stuff up. Next, next one, please. The Great Seal of the United States. When you do research on the seal, it looks a lot like Horus, the Egyptian god. But also, there are 32 feathers on one side and 33 feathers on the other side of the eagle, which in the Scottish Rite Freemasonry, you have 33rd, second degree Mason and 33rd degree Freemasonry. Anyway, again... Research your own time. Do you guys want me to keep going, by the way? You want me to stop? Okay. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. So here we have the Capitol building, and you see its layout. 
is an owl. You also see this pyramid right here. Again, this is a picture above the Capitol building. If you go online and you research, um, ah, what is it? Bohemian Garden. What? Bro. 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 Grove, that's what it is. Thank you. I thought you were saying bro. It's a place where Obama went. It's a place where Bush went. It's a place where a lot of our presidents go and they worship at this big, huge owl and they make chants and it's really creepy. An owl, by the way, again, Bohemian Grove, Cali, it's in Cali. There's a lot of secret weird stuff that's happening. Next one, please. Do you know this is our dollar pyramid, all seeing eye down at the bottom in English? That means new world order. Who wants to move to Cuba with me? Sorry for that history lesson that you never got in school. But you can do your own research. Now, listen, this is where the ultra MAGA spirit gets. Don't. He will give. The spirit without measure to a people without mixture. I want you to understand our country was founded by Christians. 33% of our constitution has biblical references tied to it. That's why people hate the constitution. They want to get rid of it. Do you know why bankruptcy only last seven years in America, it's because that ties back to the Bible. Do you know why you need two witnesses in the court of law? It ties back to the Bible. So much of our constitution ties back to the Bible. So what happened, Chris? I see all this Freemason stuff, but I also see a lot of good godly stuff coming from our nation, right? Uh, uh, One of the first acts of Congress was to send Bibles to the colonies because they knew if people obeyed the Bible, then we wouldn't need police. We wouldn't need big government. The people would learn how to obey God and police themselves. So there's a lot of good. So what happened? What happened? What happened? Well, just like, just like with Black Lives Matter, some of the founders are trained Marxists. And so some of the social justice stuff is true and good and right, but also there's a lot of Marxism in there. I want you to understand as well, Freemason doctrine, according to Manly Hall, is chaos, chaos, then order. Understand what's going on. So you can have, so so listen, I, I want you to turn now to Revelation 18. This is what I I, I want us to understand. So, Chris, we're talking about Babylon now. So Babylon represents, at a big level view, the Antichrist worldwide commercial empire. This will one day rule the world. Babylon represents Babel, which is man's attempt to create a new world order that does not include the God of the Bible. For us today, understand, church, that the world system and economy will one day crash. Babylon will crash. We see that in Revelation chapter 18. The church needs to be aware, just as 
There was a mixture in the founding of our nation because, see, here's the deal. Freemasons can be Christians, if you will, meaning they believe in Jesus, they believe in the Bible, but, but Freemasonry believes in the great architect, which is why you have the compass and the, and the, and the uh, whatever it is. So, so, so that is above Instead of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way, Freemasons believe Muslims are getting in. All roads lead to heaven. So just because George Washington was a Christian, he was also a Freemason. It's a dual mixture going on. Again, critical race theory. Is there some truth in there? There's some, there's some, there's some, but guess what? It is flooded with Marxism. We've got to be careful of the mixture. Now, forget about America now. And God, please help us to do that, because some of us are like freaking out right now. And I want you to say, Holy Spirit of God, is is there any mixture in me? Is there any mixture in me? Because when we begin to ask the Holy Spirit to look at us individually and also the church over the past 2000 years of church history, there's always been a mixture. There's always been a mixture. And so, yeah, you can follow Jesus, but you could have false doctrines that are in your life that you're following at the same time. Again, Derek Prince says this, you can cast out the devil, but you cannot cast out your flesh. You and I have our flesh to the day we die. And this is why Paul says, die daily. Because, listen, I can walk away from food and even fast for 40 days. And then some time, and I'll be walking with freedom, and then some time will go by, and I'll smell the donuts. And all of a sudden, the resurrection of my flesh comes alive. Woo, Jupiter donuts. Woo! There's a resurrection of my flesh. Listen, and this is us, the church. That's why we've got to die daily. It's why we need to invite the Holy Spirit in, because without the Holy Spirit, who's the spirit of truth, you won't know if you have mixture in your life. Listen, MAGA spirit, good. Make America godly again. Ultra MAGA, I'm playing with you guys. There's one spirit, the Holy Spirit, and you better make sure that that's your foundation. Because kingdoms are going to fall and, and come and fall, guys. Now, we don't have time to get into what you should do politically but you need to be involved. We need Christians in political places, but I don't have time to get into that. My concern today is are we personally and as a church walking with any mixture? If it is, God expose it and uproot it. There's been all ideologies that have crept into our church where people have taken on a different spirit than the Holy Spirit because of worldly philosophies. And I've seen their lives crash because they begin to believe something that came from the world and not the Bible. And let me just tell you this. Sometimes I post on Facebook things. When there's a post that John the Baptist didn't do a community survey before he went to reach the community, he heard God And then he went and he told the community to repent. That offends people who've taken on a different spirit. That offends people who find identity in their ethnicity. It is offensive. And they don't like it. That's why I'm not liked. But I want to make sure I'm walking with the purity of the Holy Spirit in my life. 
And listen, listen, America, listen. Barna just came out with this. Only 6% of Americans believe in a biblical worldview. 6%. That means 94% probably won't like you. Revelation 18.1. Don't! After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was made bright with his glory, and he called out with a mighty voice. I want you to highlight, he came down from heaven, great authority, and bright with glory, and a mighty voice. Came down from heaven, great authority, bright with glory, mighty voice. I want you to jot this down. We don't have time. Exodus 34, 29. It says this. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he had two tablets in his hand, and he came down, and the skin of his face shone because he'd been in the presence of God. Do you see the correlation of Revelation 18.1 and what Moses did? He came down, did the authority of the word, and he glowed. Second Corinthians 3.17, it says this, And we, with all, with unveiled face, we behold the glory of the Lord, being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. This is why in worship, focus on Jesus. Look at Jesus, behold him, because who you behold is who you become. Forget about everything else in here. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And so I want you to turn to to Luke 10, 38, please. So here we have Revelation 18.1, and here we have Moses. You see the same kind of movement. They're in the presence of God. They came down with the word and spoke with authority, and they were, they were, they were filled with a glory. Both people had those attributes. Now here we are in Luke 10.38. It says, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha came to him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary. And I want you to highlight this part, please, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. There's two things that I really want you to walk away with today. Forget about the Washington Monument, okay? You and I need to model our life after Larry, Larry, Mary, I need help, Lord, more than I know. It's two things. She sat at his feet, listened to his teaching. Two things. It's very simple, but rarely done. You know why? Because we're all recovering Martha's. We've also been under the Martha pastor. That says, don't you know the 11 o'clock, there's no one to hold the babies? Don't you care? Don't you care that there's dishes to be done? Don't you care there's kids out there in the streets? And if you don't get out of the pews, listen, this isn't a cruise ship. It's a battleship. Oh, Pastor Martha, using guilt and passive aggressive statements to guilt the sheep and to getting up and serving. By the way, I've repented of that if you're like, oh, that's you, Chris. No, I already repented, so Jesus has forgiven me. But again, if you don't serve at the 11 o'clock hour, I don't know if you're in or not. It's a joke. Martha was distracted by much serving. Cor Russell said this. We're called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and strength and our neighbor as ourself. What we've done by serving way too much is we loved our neighbor first and Jesus gets the leftovers. I've been guilty of that. Help me. I have a problem. I have a problem. Serving way too much.
Martha was distracted with much serving. She went and said, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care? My servant has left me serve alone. Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and you're troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Now, here's the deal. Consecration week's coming up. If you've never been to a consecration week, this is what it is. We, we stop everything we do as a church. We cancel our outreaches. We cancel our house churches. We just cancel everything. And we come in here in, in, in our church office, which is on Tamron Avenue and 17th, and we pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We don't stop. We do three-hour shifts, and in the, the shifts are broken down like this. We read God's word for the first hour. Now, why do we do that? Well, listen, what, go back to Mary. What was she doing? She was sitting at the feet. Can you sit for three hours? Or are you too distracted? Can you sit or are you too busy? It's a question. No legalism. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I don't have time. I don't know. You might want to check that thought. Not only did she sit, but she listened to his what? Teaching. That's why we start the first hour in the Bible, in the word of God, because we want our worship to be word-based. We want our worship to be scripture-fed and spirit-led. We want our worship to start with listening to his teaching, first hour. After that hour, the second hour, we sing. We adore we put on worship music for an hour. And then the third hour, we pray. But we just don't pray. We pray what we highlighted in Scripture because we want our Scripture to be, we want our prayer to be word-fed and spirit-led. This is coming up, church. It's the greatest time of the year. Better than Christmas because we get to stop everything and worship Jesus. I encourage you to be involved. And again, Revelation 18, verse 1. We got seven minutes left. But if we get this, we'll get this. You see how this angel came out? He came out of heaven and he shone with glory. He came out of heaven with authority over the word. He came out of heaven and he spoke things. And listen, when we come out of times with Jesus where his word says, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am with you in your midst. I am with you. And so we gather during consecration week together. Jesus is in the room. We shut up and listen. Then we sing to him. And then we pray what we feel like is being said through the word. We pray that back to him. We adore him. And I want to encourage you guys, the same kind of way that Moses moved, the same kind of way that angels move coming out of the presence is the same way we're supposed to move. And that's why scripture says, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, and may he make his what? Face shine upon you as you gaze into the face of Jesus, his glory, his glory, his glory. And again, consecration isn't, we want you to do this for us, Jesus. Consecration week is this, I'm setting myself apart because I'm thankful for your cross. And if you don't do anything else for the rest of my life, if you never answer one prayer in my life, if you don't move in power over my family, I don't care. The cross is enough. You are enough. You are my all. I want you. Coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you. It's all about you. Verse two, he called out with a mighty voice. He called out with a mighty voice, fallen, Babylon, Babylon, the, the great. She's become a dwelling place for demons. I want you to highlight that, please. 
A haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all the nations drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. I want you to highlight that. So we have demons highlighted in verse 2. We have sexual immorality highlighted. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the luxury of from the power of her luxurious living. And I want you to highlight luxurious living. So here's the next thing that I want you to get, church. That's why I had you highlight these things, because through the rest of 18, you're going to see three times luxurious living. You're going to see sexual immorality that's happening. And that kind of stuff apart from the Holy Spirit, is demonic. Because we've been raised up in the American dream, we don't see that with luxurious living. And I don't know what that means to you, but I want you today to make sure you're not married to a Babylonian system but you're using the system of Babylon to, 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 to seek the kingdom of God first. God lays up the treasures of the unrighteous for the righteous. And so make sure we're kingdom first people. Make sure we're not just doing it for the bag. Or for money, okay? For some of you, people didn't get that. Verse 4, I heard a voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Man, you want to highlight that. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins and share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. I want you to turn to 1 John two fifteen, please. Church, I want you to write this down. It's one thing to identify the demonic. It's another thing to renounce it. The SBC, Southern Baptist Convention, in the 90s, identified Freemasonry was all up in their denomination. They said it's not compatible with Christianity, but I did not, and I cannot find, maybe you can, because it may be there, but I cannot find them ever saying, if you're a Freemason in the SBC, you need to renounce it, and you need to come out of it. It's one thing to identify the demonic, but it's another thing to renounce, to renounce. And come out. See, because this is the gospel, Colossians 1.13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's why we seek the kingdom first, because Jesus is the king, and he has a kingdom, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. You should be in 1 John 2, by the way. But listen to James 4.4. 4. Listen to what it says. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The Babylonian world system, church, we've got to make sure we're not aligned with that. 1 John 2.15, it says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, for all that is in the world, the desires of flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world's passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And this is important, verse 18. It's the last hour. The Antichrist is coming. The Antichrist is coming, but also... Many antichrists have come, i.e. Hitler. Therefore, we know it's the last hour. Once you go down to 1 John 3.
everyone who makes a practice. Verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. In him there is no sin. If you abide in Christ today, church, you're, go- you're not going to be led into sin. Your flesh will rise up and you'll be tempted and drawn away. But your motive, your motive is to live pure and holy before the Lord because his holy seed, the Holy Spirit is in you. Verse five. He appeared to take away sins and in him there's no sin. Verse six. And no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. You might want to highlight that. You cannot keep sinning. And abide in him. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. And let me just say, church, I pray you are not under deception of a false grace that has been promoted in the American Christianity that you can do whatever you want to do and his blood covers you. Look again, verse 6. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, lest no one deceives you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. But whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. So there, it doesn't mean that you make mistakes and sin. We all do that. But if you are flat out practicing and planning, how can I sin? Then there's a concern. There's a real big concern for me. I don't know if you're saved. You may have prayed that prayer, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What scriptures say? That's all I know. That's all I know. What scriptures say? No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. He cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it's evident who are the children of God and who the children of the devil are. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is one who does not love his brother. Wow. Heavy stuff today. And this is why we start off with a few songs worshiping God. This is why we go to the word, because how many of us were worshiping Jesus while worshiping other things? Because there's a mixture in our life that's been exposed. That the Holy Spirit right now is putting his finger on you, saying, hey, you've been living for my kingdom and your kingdom, and it's time to stop. It's time to be all in for the kingdom of God as your main priority. When you look at your your schedule this week, what is number one? How can I advance your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? How can I do that? And how can I do that in such a way so that you are glorified, Jesus, and not me? And I want to put that before you every week because Matthew 6.33 says, seek the kingdom first, his righteousness, and all these things. What's all these things? In context, that's money, clothes, food, everything will follow. We'll follow. We don't follow money. Money follows us in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Money, get behind me. Yeah, it is behind me because it keeps following me. As I keep... My focus on the plow. And I don't look to the left or to the right because you're not fit for the kingdom. Kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. No mixture, no mixture. He'll give his spirit without measure to the heart that's without mixture. Last place and then we're done. 2 Corinthians 6. Second Corinthians 6. Purify us, God. Purify your bride. Bring us back to a heart of worship so that we're like Mary sitting at your feet, sitting there because we want you. 
where we're willing to bring our alabaster jar and break it over your feet. Not worried what other people will think because that money should have been given to the poor. Where we're at your feet listening for your teaching. God, raise up a generation in here where our desire, our desire, our desire is for the word of God. Because when I hide his word in my heart, I will not sin against him. How can a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed to your word. Please don't let me wander from your commandments. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's Psalm 119, 9 through 11. Young men, you want to be pure. Hide his word. Hide his word. Hide his word. Sit. Word. Sit. Word. Sit. Word. Throw this thing into the garbage. And pray that for me. But the second thing, we've got to come out. We're, they're going to have to read. Turn it back up real quick. <laughs> Second Corinthians 6.14. Thanks, brother. Way to be on it. Way to be thinking ahead. Leadership's navigation, my man. Be encouraged. Do not. Is it an option? Oh, my gosh, this guy really likes me. He's so cute. He's not a Christian yet, but I believe I can make him a Christian. What do you think, pastor? Well, it doesn't matter what I think. What has scripture said? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Listen. What fellowship has light with darkness? What, a, what accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Do you see the amount of idols and idolatry in our nation's capital? We are, we are, we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them. I will walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. Be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be like a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since, verse chapter 7, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. And this is what God is doing. He's bringing us back to a heart of worship where it's all about him. That, that, that consecration time, that would be a start of a reviving of us, that we would be able to let the distractions go away, that we're there because we love you, because we want you. We sit and we listen to his word. And we also welcome the Holy Spirit to purify us, to cleanse our hearts, to expose any mixture that we've had. And that we would be completely pure. Completely pure. Living in luxury, sexual immorality. See, sex outside of marriage, sexual immorality. Sex is not bad. The love of luxury, the love of money is the root of all evil, right? Guys, money is not bad. The love of money is. And the demonic, the demonic with those three things comes in and perverts them. And so God is here today because he wants to purify us. He wants us to come out of the world system, the Babylonian system. Because he's raising up a church. That's not going to sell out. He's raising up a church and a people that will not bow down. That would rather go into the fire and be burned like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego than sell out Jesus. He's raising up a church that says, I pledge allegiance to the kingdom of God. And I will honor the authority in this kingdom, but when that authority goes against the kingdom of God, that's where my allegiance lies. And I put my heart on that. I'm all in for his kingdom. So God, 
I've said enough. Your word has said enough. Holy Spirit, fall in this place. I thank you that you are here. And I just pray, God, as, as water from a faucet flows into a, a dirty cup, that as the water flows comes in, the, the dirtiness just overflows out. And it's that, Jesus, that we trust and hope in. It's that Jesus that we trust you to do where it says that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, we ask for a fresh cleansing today in the name of Jesus. God, we renounce. We just renounce any allegiance to anything ungodly. Whatever that is, we renounce it, we repent of it, and we come out. And we ask, God, that you would so purify us, that you would give us clean hands and pure hearts so that we would not lift our heart to another. You are seeking worshipers, true worshipers that worship in spirit and in truth. and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.